for you anyway. A lot goes into that. And I want to help you find your place in the ministry. Um, every team, we have, we have ministry opportunities in every area of the church. So if you're needing a place to work and minister and be used, it's not because uh, there's not a place. So you let the need be, or let that be known that you're wanting to be used, and then couple that with a willing attitude, we can find somewhere for you to do something in the kingdom of God. I promise you that. And uh, like this, you know, sometimes you just feel used up, burnt up, and thrown away. Well, that's how these weeds felt, or these vines felt. Just old dried vines out behind Viola's shop, I suppose. But nonetheless, somebody got together and made something out of them. Are you hearing me say amen? So it's now no longer just dried vines, but after a few people got some bleeding hands and, you know, some nicks and cuts, they got it all spelled out to help you get rooted. Amen? If God can use old dried vines, he can use you. Amen. Amen. Tonight I have a good task ahead of me. I have a great task ahead of me. And I put it, how many of you read my tweet? Or on Facebook you saw it? Some of you come tonight just to get the recording. Some of you come tonight just to see. I wonder how in the world he going to say God hates somebody. So you come tonight as a spectator or a side judge or whatever. And I'm glad you did. Because I'm happy to do my calling, and that is to preach and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel, I'm going to tell you this, and I know some people don't like it, but the gospel always offends somebody. That's just how it is. It is a bloody gospel, and everyone is not always going to embrace the gospel. My goal is not to pacify nor please you. You notice how quiet that got? Now, Pastor, you're supposed to love us, and I do. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. Amen. I don't want to go to the doctor and him find out I got some serious ailment where I'm about to check out, and then him tell me, well, you just got a little fever. You'll be all right in a few weeks, a few days. No, I want to know the truth. So, I, I've heard all my life, that, uh, that God is love, and he absolutely is. I have heard that, uh, you know, God loves us more than anything, and he does. And I have never heard ever that God hates anybody. Till I was reading the Bible yesterday and found out that he does. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness. I had people stop by my office today and ask me and uh, they looked at me and they said, oh, I'm trying to think of who it could be. Could it be Satan? Um, I said, well, you know, it could be me or you. I hope it's not, but let me just get at it. All right, how, let's, let, let's notice it. I want to read something real quick. Notice with me Proverbs chapter number 6 and verse 16 through 19. Now, before we get there, let me just say it's unbelievable for so many people to think that God could hate. Are you with me? They consider him as only a God of love, and they reason this kind, uh, they reason they have this kind, the reason they have this kind of reaction is the result of the following, what's this, deductive arguments. Now, I don't know how much you know about logic and deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning and all that, but nonetheless, the major premise in that deductive reasoning is that God is love. The minor premise is that love is the opposite of hate, and that is also true. Now, then the conclusion that comes from this major premise that God is love and this minor premise that uh, love is the opposite of hate, we come to the conclusion that God cannot hate anything. That's what we conclude wrongly. But that is not true because God does hate certain things, and I found out in my study, now, please don't walk out on me yet until I finish, but I found out that God hates two people. Wow. I know you're on the edge of your seat, so I'm going to hook this one and I'm going to share it with you. But God is love, and that is true, but, but he hates evil. So now we 
we can see the same thing in our human relationships. Watch this. You love your little child, but you hate the fever that's racking his body. You love your little child, but you hate the bulldog that's at the door because he mauled your dog. I mean, your child. Are you with me? Say amen. So you, you love, but yet you hate. And, so it's, and we are made in the image of God, are we not? And, you, and I know it's got to get deeper than, you know, children and puppy dogs and all that for you to believe it. So I want to go right back to the Word of God, if I may. But let me say this. Ecclesiastes 3 and 8 says this. The Word of the Lord tells us uh, to love the good and hate the evil. The Bible tells us when we get to the book of Ecclesiastes that there is a time to love and a time to hate. Now, notice the text with me, if you will. And uh, there is a New King James Version. Um, so he says, these six things, say that word, things. Now, a noun is a what? Person, place, or thing. These six things the Lord hates. So we understand now that, that God does have the capability of hating something. And a noun is a person, place, or thing, right? Now, we, we're at least clear that far. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Verse 2, or, or the next verse. Number one, a proud look. Now, now, now it's not going to be so simple for me to just say this. I'm going to have to go through it with you. But I'm just going to read this and, and, and throw this thing out there. He said, God hate, I mean, it's a proud look, a lying tongue, Hands that shed innocent blood. Now, now, can we back up one? Just, I, I want to show you something real quick. These are descriptors of our anatomy. Are you with me? A proud look. Somebody looks real proud. And I'm going to explain what that is, and I hope you don't fit the mold, but if you do, you'll know. A proud look. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are swift in running to evil. Uh-oh, we got a problem here. Now we've mentioned five things, five things that, that the Lord hates. And these first things were, they were nouns, uh, person, place, or thing. But what is this? Now, I've tried to look at this every kind of way. A, what's this? This now, witness becomes, what's this now? And the word, the, and one, it says, a false witness who, now we move to a personal pronoun. Are you hearing me? Someone, a false witness, a liar. So now we're not talking about a tongue or a look or a hand or a heart, but we are talking about a person. He said, God hates a false witness who, that lets me know, who says it's somebody, not something. This is not my hand doing it. It's not my feet. It's not my heart. It is not my head. It is a person. A false witness, a who, and I'm not talking about on the Grinch, you know, from Whoville, but a false witness who speaks lies, what's this, and here's the next one, and one, that's a personal pronoun, and one who sows discord among brethren. He said, so God hates these five things that are nouns. He hates a proud look. Uh, well, that actually, you know, a proud look would describe us, maybe an adjective there to describe us but being a noun. He says um, he hates a proud look. He hates feet that are swift to evil. He hates hands that devise certain things. He hates a, a bad heart and all that. But he gets right down, he names five things, and now here's the real crux of it. He said he hates two people. He hates false witnesses who speak lies. And then he hates somebody. You plug in the name, I don't care, that sows discord among 
the brethren. I never, and I've been in this all my life, all my life, I never knew God hated anybody. Now that does not mean that God can't change his mind about you if you repent. Are you hearing me? That does not mean, now, no, 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 oh, uh, Sister uh, Media, did we get um, that little box? Can we throw, throw that slide up there? I want to show you. Because some of y'all are doubting me, and I knew you was going to doubt me, so I figured I'd be ready for you. The Hebrew word comes to us. It's the Hebrew, the number for it is 5707, if you want to check it out later. But the word is, the definition of witness, or, or that definition of that Hebrew word is a witness. And he says, concretely it means a witness. I mean, a person. So if I'm talking about a false witness, concretely I am speaking about a man or a woman. Abstractly, I may be speaking about what they said, their testimony. Are you hearing me say amen? But the Bible did not give us the out to say in the abstract their testimony. He used the personal pronouns of saying the who and the he. Are you hearing me? And that witness, so he says God hates these five things and these two people. Y'all with me? Everybody all right? So then, what do we have to do? I, I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to be hated of God. So I'm not going to sow no discord among the brethren. I'm not going to stir the pot. You know what the Bible said to stir? He said, stir up the gift of God that is in you. Not stir up dissension among brothers and sisters in the faith. He said, God hates that person that sows discord among the brethren. So, that, 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 that just amazes me. That, so now I need to uh, uh, share this thought with you. So... There's six things the Lord doth hate, yet seven abomination to him. And then that, that six, seven um, uh, uh, formula there is found at several other places in the Bible. I don't have time to go there, but uh, nonetheless. He says, a proud look. That means exalted eyes. Those who will not condescend to look on the rest of mankind. Um, yeah, I, I think a lying tongue is pretty much self-explanatory, but uh, he don't love the truth. Did you know what will set you free? It's not the lie. It's not the shadow of darkness. It's not that. Even when the truth hurts, the truth will set you free. Um, so let, let, me, um, let me just move on. He says, he that sows discord among the brethren, God hates. So I, I want to... Um, say that God definitely says that he hates certain things. So there's no ambiguity there. We know God hates certain things, certain actions, and I submit to you certain people based on this. Now, when someone finds the error of their way and they receive correction or instruction and they repent, I believe God relents. In fact, I can show you since you're thinking about it, Jonah went to the city of Nineveh, that great city, and he cried against it and said, Repent, for yet in 40 days God will rain fire and brimstone upon you. Now, if you, if you repent, uh, God may re repent of the evil that he plans to do. And we know what happened. He preached this. They called a fast. And the Bible says God relented and did not do the evil that he had purposed in his heart to bring against them. So if we correct our ways and accept the grace of God and receive the forgiveness and say, Lord, I don't want to do that no more. Repentance means to turn 180 degrees from, to turn away from. He says, if we do that, God says, you know what? I'll back off of what I'm thinking about you. I'm going to go on. Some of y'all are still struggling. It ain't the first time God said he hated anything. If you can go all the way back to Deuteronomy, we find in 16 and 22, he said, neither shall thou set up anything which the Lord thy God hates. Psalm 45, we see the, uh, the great millennial psalm. He said, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. You see, one follows the other as the night follows the day. God said to the early church in the book of Revelation, But this thou hast, 
that thou hast the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He says, you see, God loves, but God hates. Now, I know we live in a world that don't want to hear that. We live in a world that is filled with churches that says there's no wrong in anything. And we live in a world where we are prone to be and prodded to be politically correct instead of biblically correct. And I'm not trying to, to uh, say that God does not love you. I'm not saying that, that God will not forgive. I am simply saying there is a standard. It's called the Bible. God wrote it. I didn't. Holy men of God wrote as the Holy Spirit moved upon them, and they penned these words for us. These are the words that we must live by. You see, the number seven in the Bible indicates to us not perfection, but completeness. And I would say to you, God has a complete hatred of these things that I have defined right now, these seven things, the works of the flesh, if you will. They are, uh, they are things that reveal the total depravity and the utter degradation of the human species. Now, God has gone on record to say that I hate these things. Why would we who call ourselves Christian want to do something that God has gone on record saying that he hated? Amen? So, um, that's just a good question for you. Um, now, I want to look at them individually. I want us to look at this ugly and hateful brood that I've mentioned. This belongs to the hate side of, of God's ledger, if you will. God said, and I'm going to lay this out for you, I hate a proud look. Now listen, there's a difference in a proud look and being proud of your child that just now won a scholarship or being proud of your son that just now caught the touchdown pass and you won the state championship or the little league championship. There, there's a difference in that, so please don't malign the word of God, okay? I, I don't want to get stupid and start running down foolish little paths like that. So please, um, let, let's be grown up as we look at it here. The literal uh, meaning here is the eyes of loftiness. It is the attitude that overvalues self and undervalues everyone else. This is called pride. It is the thought of the heart, that little look and that turn of the face, that flash of the eye which says, I'm just a little bit better than you are. God says, I hate that look. He said, it's number one on my list. I don't like it. When people look at you and they know that you're looking at them and they just have that little puff of arrogance about them. God says you can have that look, you can have all that money, you can have all of that, but I want you to know I hate your stinking attitude. The emphasis is mine. All right. So, uh, so God hates a proud look. He said, it is strange, if you will, that in churches today, one can get by with a proud look. Nobody even puts it in check. No one says much about it. Do you know the very first sin that took place in heaven that got uh, Lucifer in that day kicked out of heaven was a proud look? Cocky, arrogant. He says, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I, I, I. And God says, I hate that look. Now listen, don't look at nobody right now. Just look straight ahead. Have you ever taught somebody all that? Man, they couldn't say five words without saying I. Everything was about where they've been, what they've done, what they can do, what they will do. Oh, I, 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 me, myself, and I, praise God, I. Right? And God is throwing up in heaven. Are you with me? Say amen. Or oh me. Something. But God is not, he don't like it. The person that God, the Bible says that he loves those of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. 
Did you know the Pharisee that would not, I mean the publican rather, he's in the temple, the Pharisee's over here saying, I thank my God that I'm not like this publican over here. I pay tithe of all that I get. I fast and I pray and I dress nicely when I come to the Lord's synagogue. And I do all of this like the Pharisees with their phylacteries and all of this. And I cross all of my T's and I dot all of my I's. And God is sick in heaven. The Bible says this publican, he wouldn't even look up toward God, but he beat on his chest and said, Oh, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And the Bible said God had respect to him. And God was moved by him. God's not moved by my pride or my arrogance or what I think I am or what everybody else tells me I am. God knows who you really are. Lord, help me. I know it's Wednesday night. This is supposed to be a sandwich to get you by to Sunday, but it's tough tonight. You see, uh, that's how it is. Um, it's quite interesting to me that behind all the psychological disturbances and the psychosomatic disease, there is a trunk of tree, if you will, from which abnormality springs, they say. Do you know what it is? It is the lack of being a complete personality. It is wanting to be somebody important. It is wanting a certain status in life or a certain symbol, one of which is independence of God, where people declare that I don't need God. I've had people leave. I don't need the church. I don't need you. I don't need God. I don't need no help. And, you know, you, you can't argue with somebody like that. The best thing you can do is pray for them and let them roll. They'll soon find out that they do need God, that they do need the church, and many times that they do need you. But you just have to pray for them because sometimes it's not the time or the place to, to go into it. But I'm going to earn my own salvation, they say. I mean, God's got this thing worked out. I can do this myself. And who do you think you are anyway, they'll say. So I don't need you. Uh, I don't need you to help me. I don't need you to move me, et cetera, et cetera. I'll tell you this, God knows how to bring down a proud and lofty look. In the Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus said this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What, he's not saying the poor that, that, that don't have, you know, uh, um, anything to eat or no money in the bank. That's not what he's saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Study that and you'll find out somebody that's meek and lowly. Somebody that don't, they don't think more highly of themselves than they ought to. Somebody that values other people. So, um, let me move on to the second thing. God hates a lying tongue. Can you say that with me? God hates a lying tongue. Have you ever noticed that there's far more said throughout the Bible about the abuse of the tongue than there is the abuse of alcohol? The al all the people struggling with alcohol are saying, Amen, Pastor! <laughs> I'm struggling with my little toddy every now and then, and Sister Long Tongue over there has got a tongue, you know, dragging the floor. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that it's all right to drink. I'm just simply saying Listen, I, I know the church of God stands against tobacco, and I know they stand against alcohol. But Paul, I mean, you know, he did tell Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Now, now listen, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not advocating drinking. I'm just simply saying there's so much scripture out there against a lying tongue, but yet we'll fall apart over somebody drinking NyQuil. Now, I know some of you drink two or three bottles, but I'm just saying. I'm not about to run out to the package store or anything like that. I've not gone crazy. But I'm saying we need to bring balance to the Word of God. And I have seen people of late that will swallow a camel and strain on a gnat. That's what Jesus said. Pharisees. I mean, good Lord, he said, you polish the outside and you make the sepulcher. You, you just doll it up, but inside they still dead men's bones. He said, you take the cup and the saucer and you make it look so good, but inside is filthy. Nobody wants to drink out of that. You polished it for everybody to see it, but God said, I still see on the inside. 
So God hates a lying tongue. Now, see, we're talking about he hates a proud heart, a lying tongue, but you know, I ain't going to say it. We'll get there in a minute. The abuse of the tongue is something that is so common to all races and all languages. People talk about uh, tongues, uh, the tongues movement. But there, there's a big tongues movement today. It has been for a while. You know what it is? It ain't the Holy Spirit. It, it ain't the heavenly language. It's gossip. It's a lying tongue. How tragic in the house of God. We ought to have a tongue problem where everyone in that heavenly language between them and God or for the edification of the church. Are y'all hearing me say amen? Some of y'all probably going to say, i got to find me somewhere else to go. That's all right. Don't let the Lord hit you. Uh, I know some of y'all went ahead and said it, where the good Lord splits you. Right? Might as well say it because y'all thought it. Listen, the psalmist, probably David, said this. I said in my haste, all men are liars. That's what David said. You see, Dr. W.I. Carroll said this. He used it in a class when he was instructing one day. He said, David said in his haste that all men are liars. Now, I've had a long, long time to think it over, and I agree with David. I'll admit that I agree with David, too. All men are liars. That's what W.I. Carroll said. I'm not saying that he's right. I'm saying that's what he said. Again, the psalmist said, what's this? Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Can I tell you something? Let me tell you something. As a man or a woman, sinner or saint, all you've got is your word. All you've got is your integrity. You are who, uh, are you living who you say you are? Uh, or, your word, that's your bond, and that's it. So you can dress it all up how you want to, but a lying tongue God hates. Now, let's go on. In David's prayer of confession, he says, Behold the Lord, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. He says, God is a God of truth. Into thy hands, he says, I commend my spirit, commit my spirit, Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God, of truth. Now, the third thing God hates, God hates, he says, hands that shed innocent blood. Now, if you're called to fight for your country and you have to shed blood because you've been called to fight, God don't hate you for that. Some people ab, uh, you know, object and abstain from going because of religious reasons, but if you go and you have to pull the trigger, you have to push the button, God don't hate you for that. You're doing what you're called to do. He said, but if you shed innocent blood, you know somebody's innocent. You know somebody's not, you know, uh, guilty, and yet you shed their blood. He said, that's a different story altogether. So, uh, let me move on, if I may. Uh, you see, a murderer is particularly um, hated, for the most part, in today's society. However, I will say this. One of the first things that happen now in the life of a murderer is if he murders somebody, someone usually gets appointed and immediately um, they give him a lawyer concerned for his life and for his safety. Are you with me? Say amen. So, the Bible says hands that shed innocent blood. So, if we have shed innocent blood, the Lord says... I hate that. The fourth thing God hates is a heart that devises wicked imaginations and the thoughts of iniquity. You see, all mankind has evil thoughts. We know that. Now listen, evil thoughts are going to come through your head, but you're the one, you don't have to allow it to build, uh, you know, the birds might fly over, but you ain't got to let them build a nest in your hair. Right? So, Jesus said, for out of the abundance of the heart, watch, Proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. It is an ugly brood that comes out of this heart. By the way, have you ever confessed to God what you have in your mind and in your heart? Maybe in your heart you just want to kill somebody. 
You ever thought about telling God about that? Lord, help me with that. I don't want to feel that way about someone. We need to cleanse ourselves from those kinds of thoughts. See, God's dealing with the anatomy of evil and iniquity, and it includes our eyes, it includes our tongues, our hands, our heart, our feet. You see, the next thing he says is that he hates feet that are swift to mischief. But I want to say something. Long before your feet run to evil, you thought it. You thought it. Before your hands do mischief, you thought it. Before that guy walked into the school up in, uh, in the north, before he got to Sandy Hook, he had already thought it out, he had already planned it out, and he began to run his hands and feet to mischief. The guys years ago in Columbine, same thing. They had thought it out. They had planned it out. The underwear bomber, although he got caught, he had planned it out. Bin Laden with the Twin Towers, he had planned it out. You see, long before our feet run to evil. See, the heart blazes the trail that the feet will follow. Isaiah the prophet put it like this. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are the thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. These are on the things God hates list. Now, we've talked about these five things. We, we're back now at these two people. And herein lies the crux of the whole message. This, this is the bone of contention that pastor would say in electronic format for the whole world. My Lord, he's a pastor of the harbor. Now he's told people we're trying to win people. He's told there's two people that God hates. The truth is it could be any of our names. It could be anybody that is a false witness that tells lies. You see, it is not uncommon today for someone to perjure themselves under oath. I was a bailiff for five years. People come and take the stand. Would you raise your right hand, please? Yes. Do you solemnly swear that you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm? They lay their hand on the Bible, they raise their hand. People will say that and sit right down and tell you a bald face lie. There's people so good at it, they can beat the polygraph. They can look you in the eye. And they've learned to beat horizontal gaze and uh, all of the, the techniques that the FBI uses to determine whether or not you're lying to them while they're looking at you. Took a couple of them classes myself, so be careful. <laughs> in fact, I don't even listen. Uh, and some of the people that's been counseling with me before, they've told me some of the most ridiculous tales before, and I just flat said, let me stop you right there, please. Please, please. Don't tell me you've been living together for two years and you ain't sleeping together. Now, don't think I ain't said it. You can be a fly on my wall. You can be a fool if you want to. I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. Are you hearing me? I can't tell you the times. I, I bet you I've been told that a half a dozen times in the last two years. Half a dozen times in the last two years. And so normally I don't want to start no counseling on false pretense. I don't want to start on a lie. So I, I, I had a couple with me just a few months ago. They just began telling me, you know, we're living together. Uh, he stayed on his end of the house. I stay on my end of the house, and uh, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We and I said, let me stop you, please. How long y'all been living together? Oh, a um, good while now, about a year. I said, I, I want you to know that I'm not buying the fact that he stays down there, and you stay down there, and you don't ever meet in the middle. So if you make an appointment to come to counsel me, you better come ready to tell the truth because we're going to investigate the truth. I don't like doing counsel anyway. So, uh, <laughs> so I can be blunt and just straight. And uh, I love leadership counseling, don't get me wrong. I love crisis counseling. If you're in a crisis, I, call me. I'm your man. But I'm really not the one to sit on the couch three times a week for six months. There's a place for that. Listen, I don't got too transparent. <laughs> Let me try to redeem myself and climb out of this hole. There's a place for that, and, and it is needed. 
I promise you. And there are qualified ministers that they enjoy that. I just don't happen to be one of them. And so my position as a pastor is to equip the saints of God. So as long as I've got one on the staff or available that can handle that kind of stuff, I don't have to. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, you know why? Because what business does a master mechanic that can fix anything on a car, why does he need to be trying to play the piano? Huh? Don't know squat about the piano, but knows everything about a car. Man, we need to have him fixing cars. You understand? It has to do with gifts and callings. And Now, a lot of people say, now, Pastor, I'm with you until you just don't let me do what I want to do. Now, don't go out and talk about me now because God can't stand somebody stirring up discord. <laughs> All right. So you leave here tonight and call your buddy. Just remember what God thinks about you. Anyway. So, um, but people nowadays perjure themselves and they don't think nothing about it. They will lie and drop a hat. Now, now listen, this is, this is so true. I've seen so many times that people will tell what they call a white lie. I didn't know there was no racism with the lies. I thought they was all just lies. Let me, here, here's what a lie really is. Is if you tell it intending to deceive that person. And there are some times people have said something. You didn't intend to deceive somebody. That's just your knowledge at that time or how you felt at that time. But if you're intentionally trying to deceive somebody, you lie. No, it's quiet in it. It's quiet, I know it. My Lord, I can feel that one bouncing around the room. Mm -hmm. Like being on the old zipper down at the fair. You don't never know which way you're going. So the seventh thing, he said, God hates false witnesses that speak lies. The personal pronoun God hates that witness that tells lies. Now, he said, and then God hates the sower of discord, that one that sows discord among the brethren. I'll tell you something. I thought about something a number of years ago. Not, not even in this church, but I had someone, in fact, I had just won Ken and Tara to the Lord. Uh, so you know, Lord, they old as water. So uh, <laughs> that's been, Lord, how many years ago? I've been here 17 years. I was there for five, so that's, what, 22 years. I, they, they got saved six months after I went to Claxton, so it's been 22 years ago. And I'm reaching out to people, and I, and I won this couple, and I had known them because we were in service together, and he got out of service before I did, and so we, we've been apart now for three, four, five years or something. But um, uh, I, I win them to the Lord, and, and God just saves them miraculously and does some wonderful things for them. And I have this crazy lady in the church that was a, the daughter of a church boss. Y'all with me? Y'all don't know no, no. no. And, uh, man, no sooner are we trying to win, we're winning families. We're winning couples in their 20s with children. That's how churches grow, don't you know? You know, we, we better, as, as I approach the 50 mark and then the 60 mark and then the 70 mark, whatever it is, we better still be winning children that are 20s and 30s with children because if we not, guess what? They're not going to be able to take care of us in the old folks' home. We'll all die out, we'll die out and die off and become irrelevant. But anyway, this lady, uh, you know, she is running around trying to drive off these young couples. I've just won four, uh, well, two at that time and two just a short time later, brand new couples. Let me tell you now, you only got about one visiting couple a month in that little town. We're talking about the fruitcake capital of the world, Claxton. I'm not kidding you. And that's all they had there was fruit cakes and chicken. Claxton chicken and Claxton fruit cake. Now y'all think I, I lived it for five years. I was there. I know. But while I'm winning people to the Lord, I have somebody been in the church for 30 years. They're running behind my back sowing discord. 
sowing discord, telling lies. Can you imagine? I'm blown away. I'm thinking I'm working all kind of hours and two or three jobs and trying to grow the church and somebody that runs around the altar speaking in tongues, supposed to be saved, supposed to be filled with the Holy Ghost, tells four lies. Not, 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 not four lies that can't be proven, but Ken's stepmother hit record on the answering machine when she called her to tell her those four lies. So when I called them to the office, I asked them about the four lies. Oh, no, Pastor. I would never say anything like that. How would you get that? I said, well, please tell me who this is on this tape. Play. Oh, my goodness. And she admitted that she had an affair with the same man in the church and her husband sitting there, and he didn't know it. Fireworks, man. Woo! Praise God. I know y'all want to be a pastor. So here's the deal. What I'm saying is how somebody supposed to be saved, supposed to be filled with the Holy Ghost, supposed to be spiritual, is going to sit here in my office two foot from me and tell me four lies, and then I'll give you the proof. She went to pieces like a basket case, screaming and squalling, turn it off, turn it off. I said, oh, no. You wanted to make sure he was here in the office. Almost insinuated I wanted to try something with him. Of course, Kelly was there. So I said, let's let him listen. Oh, Lord. He listened. Mm, mm, mm. It got bad. It got ugly. Sowing discord among the brethren. And then, now here's what I'm saying. I've just won Ken and Tara, and they are doing everything they can to get them to stay uh, in the world. Don't come to the church. Here's what Jesus said about it. It would be better that a millstone were hanged about your neck and you were cast into the midst of the sea than to offend one of these my little ones. We're talking about somebody who has just come to know Jesus Christ, and if you offend them and make them fall, the Lord said it would be better that you be cast into the sea with a millstone about your neck. God hates the sower of discord. Wow. Give the Lord praise, would you? Man, I wish I was at camp meeting. I'd love to just preach this to about 3,000 people. I'd probably have to have armed guards when I left. (laughs) Anyway, where in the world's time going when you're having fun? There are multitudes of folk sowing discord in churches all across our county. Let me tell you something. I just can't, I just let me get right here and just say this. If somebody speaks negatively against the man of God, the house of God, someone that you know is a person of God, do not, under any circumstances, listen to that garbage. Your ears are put there by God to hear the great things of God. It is not a dumpster for all the trash of the world. You hear me? I've had people tell me, did you know about Pastor so-and-so? And I have politely said, you know what? We don't know that at all. You know what the Bible says about that? He says, don't even hear an accusation against an elder except it be in the mouth of it two or at least, I mean, at least two or three witnesses. I'm not saying elders never do wrong. I'm not saying pastors never do wrong. Don't get me wrong. And when they do, they have to be dealt with. That is true. But we have to be careful. We have to be careful how we do things. If we're not careful, the devil will suck us right into a web And before you know it, we become hated of God. And then wonder why everything's going crazy in our life. Well, is it Wednesday night? There are multitudes of folks sowing discord that, you know, they're not just politicians. They're not people just politically motivated, but they are people that perhaps on your job, perhaps sit beside you at church, you see, uh, (coughs) causing trouble between brothers and between family members. God hates it. So uh, we need to look at these mirrors, or we need to look at this as a mirror and say, what is it? What is it in me that God hates? Is my hand or, or is my hand swift? Are my feet swift to eagle, e- evil? Uh, is my hands working mischief? Is my look a proud look? Is my heart devising evil? 
and absolutely refuse to be a false witness. You know what the Bible says about false witness? And we'll, we'll tie this up right here. The Bible says when Nadab, he had a vineyard. He didn't want to sell his vineyard. <clears throat> uh, uh, but the king wanted it. The Bible said they hired two scoundrels. Sons of Belial, that means sons of the devil, to come in and lie and say, We heard Naboth speak against God. Isn't that the ultimate deception there? Here it is. This was a righteous man. The king wanted his property. He offered him more valuable property, and he said, but I don't want to give up my property. This is what my daddy gave me. This is what my grandfather gave me. He said, but I'll give you something more valuable. He said, I don't want more valuable. I want my inheritance. This is my name. This is my family. This is mine. And the Bible said that his wife, Jezebel, hired two sons of Belial, two scoundrels, to come into an open court and lie and say, we have heard him. Now, I want you to see this. They say... We've heard him blaspheming God. Now, is that the ultimate pot calling the kettle black? Or what? And you know what they did? They drug him outside and killed him. And took his land anyway. You know what God did? He sent the prophet Elijah the Tishbite. And he says to them, as uh, the dogs gather around and start licking up Naboth's blood, Elijah says, I want to tell you something. Watch this. I'm going to add some italics here. This is mine right here, and I'll tell you the difference. He said, as these dogs lick the blood of this innocent man that you've just robbed and stolen because of your dis deceiving and scheming stuff, Elijah says, I tell you the truth. These same dogs will lick your blood from this chariot in this very place. It wasn't long that King Ahab got into a battle with the Syrians. Naaman the warrior, you remember Naaman? He was a leper. Why was he captain of the host of Ben-Hadad's Syrian army? Because he was the archer that flung an arrow and guided somehow by the Spirit, I believe, hit Ahab. Ahab said to his driver, I've been hit. Take me home. They wheel back to the palace and come right to that very spot where they had killed Naboth to Jezreelite. Ahab's blood's leaking out of the floor now, running down the wheel of the chariot. Here comes the dogs from the house, and they begin to lap the blood of the king that had done this. Not only that, but the prophecy said, and the dogs will eat the flesh of Jezebel. Listen, friend, you can't do wrong and get by with it forever. The delay of judgment is not the denial of judgment. I'm going to tell you, those people who have done you wrong and lied and schemed and told all kinds of foolishness on you, you can guarantee it's going to come home to roost. It's going to come home to roost. You be righteous with God. You be straight with God. You maintain your integrity with God. And God will see to it. It'll come home to roost. Stand with me. Lord, have mercy. Where's time gone? Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, we love you tonight. We honor you. I ask you to touch us. Lord, please help me to be a person of integrity. God, help me to be a man of my word. I don't ever want to be one of those that you hate. A, a false witness or one who stirs discord among the brethren. I ask you, Lord, to help everyone that's here tonight that they pledge in their heart, I will not be a sower of discord. I will not be a false witness. I will stand in integrity. I pray in the name of the Lord that you'll help us to perform it in Jesus' name. God bless you is my prayer. We love and appreciate all of you.